Thank you all uh, who attended at the hospitality suite. I, again, um, went against my better judgment and stayed out uh, too late, um, but I did not do the Chinese food, and I'm pretty sure Eldon Horner did not make it in the... Oh. <laughs> so um, this morning I wanted to uh, take a minute to just um, thank and introduce Diana Miles, uh, who is going to be opening this session with a, an update from the Law Society. Um, the Law Society has been ve is always very generous in coming. Uh, we had a terrific night last night at the Treasurer's Dinner. There were a lot of benchers there, which was really nice. Um, and there is no shortage of issues at the Law Society right now. Um, pretty meaty issues, pretty um, uh, topical. And so what I was hoping is, I, I know Diana is slotted for 45 minutes and she's indicated that she's only going to speak for probably about 30. So please do think if there's any questions or comments that you want to raise. Uh, we, will have, we will have a lot of time for discussion if you do want to discuss anything. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the acting uh, chief executive officer of the Law Society of, Upper, or Law Society of Ontario, Diana Miles. Thank you. That's going to take a while. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. It's going to take a while for people to get used to that, I think. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, going to spend a little bit of time this morning just going over a few items. Uh, some of them uh, relate to remarks that the Treasurer actually made last night, but what I'm hoping to do is actually give you the operational side of what those mean, specifically to you, so it's a bit more practical for your application. Um, and uh, then provide you with any assistance you need, and I'm happy to answer any questions on any of these. So let me just start, first of all, let me get my clicker here. Um, there we go. Let's start with the money. It's always important to start with the money. So uh, as most of you may be aware, the Law Society, the Convocation, did approve an increase to lawyers' licensing fees for 2018. The increase for next year is actually fairly significant in comparison to the last few years. Convocation approved an annual fee increase for lawyers of $267, which takes your annual fee up to $2,183 for 2018. Now, I just wanted to set out for you why that is. The majority of that increase is actually related to compensation fund increases. The compensation fund is the fund, of course, that we hold and that you all fund into in order to ensure that clients who are wronged by their lawyers who uh, engage in misconduct are actually uh, recompensed. The fund has been receiving an incredibly high adverse claims experience over the last year or two. And as a result of that, we're going to have to replenish the compensation fund to ensure that we have sufficient monetary supports for uh, members of the public who are wronged and that those are available for them. So the balance of the increase in the fee, other than the compensation fund, is only $54. And that $54 would go to support the increasing activities and uh, programs and resources that are required to ensure that all 50,000 members, lawyer members of the Law Society are supported. So let me just uh, move a little bit and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take questions later if that's all right with you. Let me just move now to licensing because I wanted to talk a little bit about this. I know you have a session later this morning and I'm sure it'll be very interesting, but I wanted to just remind you of the licensing uh, review process that we're undergoing at the Law Society and as you know, um, that is my background at the Law Society, so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. You'll recall that from April through to June of 2017, we conducted a very extensive consultation with the profession that we call the Dialogue on Licensing, and that addressed the realities and challenges that we are currently facing around lawyer licensing in the province of Ontario. We had well over 300 participants during all of those activities. We had a number of sessions across the province. We were delighted to see the number of individuals who came out to join us for those uh, focus groups and consultations. We had individuals from a variety of environments. So we did have practicing lawyers. We had uh, lawyers who are practicing in a multitude of environments, a multitude of uh, uh, firm sizes. We also had partici participants from academic um, environments and other environments. So it was really good to see everyone come out and we received a significant number of uh, comments. We also actually 
uh, did some um, outlines of all the discussions that took place in all of those sessions, and they are posted on our website if anyone does have an interest. It's really quite an enlightening uh, review of uh, information and thoughts and concerns around licensing, as well as some really good ideas that came from all of the audiences that we spoke with. So it was a very good process. It was received very well. Uh, I'd certainly, if any of you had participated in any of those sessions, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts were on that. It started as the dialogue process down a path at the Law Society that we hope we'll be able to continue. That's the idea of getting out there and doing these kinds of consultations and input and feedback sessions so that we can really hear from you directly. The committee, the professional development and committee at the Law Society is the one responsible and charged with the task of actually dealing with the, the new licensing review and determining where we're going to be going next as an organization. That committee is actually going to be reporting probably in early 2018, but it's only going to be an interim proposal report. What we are going to do is we're going to put together what our thoughts are right now on what we've heard, uh, take what we've, uh, the input we've received, and provide back our thoughts on where our next steps might be. We'd like to then go back out to the profession in Ontario and ask what you think about the proposals that we're putting forward. So please do look for that. It's likely to be January or February. We will be providing sufficient time for everyone to feed back into that review and let us know what they think of the proposal specifically and give us some direct feedback, which I think will be very helpful. It won't be until after we receive that feedback and we reconsider that again that we'll be coming forward with a final report to convocation, which is likely to be either later in the spring or if not later in the spring, it could even be next fall. So I'll look forward to hearing about your session later this morning. Wanted to talk a little bit about the Coach and Advisor Network today because I think this is something that uh, I want to bring to your attention. It is a program at the Law Society that is a result of our strategic priorities from our last term. It took us a bit of time to figure out what we were going to do here. It started as a mentoring propo proposal and we actually uh, evolved it to a Coach and Advisor Network proposal. Coaching, as you may all know, in our terminology for this particular program is really about a longer term commitment. So coaching activities or engagements usually take five or six months. Advisor activities are about providing, uh, I guess you can call it just in time advice or support to another of your colleagues who's looking for some help on a particular substantive or procedural issue on a file. So we recently held a thank you reception for CAN and we had all of our coaches and, coaches and advisors and users of the service over to the Law Society to uh, celebrate one year of very robust delivery. It's been a bit, a, whirl, a bit of a whirlwind because we do provide, for those of you who may already be involved, a lot of supports and resources, particularly for our coaches. Coaching is a bit of an art. It's not something that really one should be taking on lightly. There's a there's a way to do coaching that will be successful and there are other ways to do coaching that won't be. So we spend a lot of time with our coaches doing training, we offer lots of sessions, we work with them in groups and one-on-one -on -one to make sure that they're comfortable in the coaching that they do with their coachees. We're delighted that the program is actually growing very well and that the feedback we're receiving shows us that both there is a real need for these supports out there in the profession and also that the members of the profession are really willing to step up and step in and give back and are uh, happy to be trained and coached themselves so that they can then provide coaching to their colleagues. The um, supports that we're doing in the Coach and Advisor program really focus on making sure that our members can progress in their careers, that they can pro progress in their business and their practice development, and also their personal development. So it's really quite a well-rounded program. Um, as of last week, we actually have over almost 120 coaches who have been accredited with us and who are now providing services to their colleagues. We have 140 advisors who are ready to do just-in-time support for anyone who may need it. And we also have 80 of those individuals doing both coaching and advising at the same time. We've also made over 600 matches this year with coaches and advisors and individuals who were looking for support and assistance. And this is a significant number when you consider that the coaches are actually doing six month engagements with these people. So it's quite a great uh, result so far. And I would really like to encourage all of you to uh, think about this. 
uh, take this back to your local associations, talk to your members about becoming involved, talk to your members about using the service. We've received some really good feedback from members who have taken on a coach or had the advice of an advisor and it's really made a huge difference in their ability to progress. It's particularly important for us as the Law Society uh, when we look at our membership, when we know that a significant majority of our members are sole or small practitioners and could really use some external supports every now and then just to help with specific issues or to help them progress. So keep that in mind as you go back. Let me just speak uh, for a few minutes about an issue that the Treasurer raised with you last evening and that is the um, activities that we're undertaking in the Law Society related to equity, diversity and inclusion activities. So as the Treasurer mentioned last year, the Law Society approved a report aimed at addressing racial discrimination in the legal profession. And we put forward five different strategies which included 13 recommendations for change in that area. There are a couple of obligations that licensees have that will be formal and mandatory for the coming year and you will be required to report in your 2017 annual report which you'll get in a few weeks and will have to be filled out shortly thereafter. One of the requirements is the creation and adoption of a statement of principles and uh, the Law Society sees this statement as an important professional requirement tied to your rules of professional conduct. As the legal professions are operating in a much broader social context in which racism and discrimination is negatively impacting the lives of people in the province and our own members of the profession, we as a public interest regulator are uh, hoping to lead in our efforts to create long-lasting long sy systemic change and we're hoping to help support all of you to also do that in the public interest. The main objectives for these changes are really to create a more inclusive legal workplace in the province and to reduce barriers related to not only racism but also unconscious bias and discrimination activities. The increase, uh, increased representation of equality seeking licensees in the profession will help us as a profession to move forward positively and proactively and ideally in proportion to the representation of the Ontario population so that we're ensuring that we're providing supports in the public interest and appropriate access to justice. The second requirement uh, related to this report is the adoption of a human rights and diversity policy. Now this requirement will only apply to law firms of 10 or more licensees and this particular policy is targeted at addressing fair recruitment practices, fair retention practices and also fair uh, advancement practices within larger firm environments. I just want to segue for a moment here because this takes me to the concept of compliance or outcomes based regulation and our compliance based entity regulation task force which I know some of you are familiar with. It's been uh, working on its uh, activities in the last few months trying to determine where it would like to take the compliance based and outcomes related regulation activities in the next uh, few months. You'll recall in May of 2016 that Convocation actually approved that task force's report which recommended the development of a detailed uh, set of options for compliance based regulatory frameworks. The Law Society um, has with, related, with relation to entity regulation requested the necessary statutory amendments to allow us to be able to regulate an entity as opposed to just an individual lawyer and permit groups of lawyers to be able to attend to their compliance obligations as a team. I just wanted to spend a minute reminding you what the purpose of compliance based regulation is because it does tie into the equity, diversity and inclusion activities and our obligations as professionals to move forward together. Compliance based regulation approaches are really about reducing duplication for firms and also in the case of sole and small firms to assist us as a regulator and to assist all of us as professionals to provide supports and resources that are better able to sustain the viability of firms and to generally allow licensees to self-direct the way that they actually fulfill their regulatory obligations. What we are hoping to do here is to really provide parameters or a set of expected outcomes or principles for actually achieving a professional practice. So for helping everyone to move forward without necessarily dictating how you move forward because we know you can do that yourselves 
and as a regulator we can step back and allow you to do it in the most flexible, nimble manner possible that suits the type of practice that you actually have on the ground. So the compliance-based entity regulation task force is continuing to do its work. It's continuing to consider what principles it may bring forward and we anticipate, and this is why I thought I'd raise it today, a further consultation with the profession which we believe will be including focus groups on these matters uh, probably in the spring time frame and we certainly hope to see many of you involved in that discussion because it will be an important evolution in the manner in which we uh, proceed to regulate in the public interest. So last night the Treasurer mentioned the name change and Jay mentioned it this morning so not that any of you haven't heard but in case you haven't heard the, um, we have approved a name change and we are now going to be known as the Law Society of Ontario. Now this is going to be effective January 1st and we're going to move from the Law Society of Upper Canada and we'll start using the new name Law Society of Ontario but that name is going to be phased in over a period of 12 months. We have requested the government to make the necessary amendments to the Law Society Act so that the name is formalized but what I wanted to address with you today was what this actually means for you as individuals so that you can understand and take that back to your membership. So what does it mean for you? Well, there is absolutely no requirement come January 1st for any of you to do anything. You don't have to up update your stationery. You don't have to change your references to being licensed by the Law Society of Upper Canada to licensed by the Law Society of Ontario. No changes to printed materials, updating of your website, blogs, etc. There are no requirements here. The reference to the Law Society of uh, Upper Canada will simply be interpreted as a rep reference to the Law Society of Ontario. However, what we would like to do is encourage you to promote a closer connection between yourselves and the public and the rest of the legal profession by encouraging uh, you to actually move towards using the Law Society of Ontario as it becomes convenient for you to make those changes in your online or printed materials. Um, there, I had a few questions last night from a, from a few of you asking about the need to change the name and why we would change the name at this time. The name change is a very significant part of a very robust analysis that we did within the public uh, around awareness and the public's um, ability to actually know what a lawyer or a paralegal actually does, where to find them and how to use them. It became very clear to us through this very robust analysis that the public really has, uh, in most cases, no idea what lawyers do, let alone where to get in touch with them or how to find them. When we were going through the data and the collection of the information, which was both qualitative and quantitative, it came to our attention that many members of the public when they saw the name Upper Canada, thought we were in the Northwest Territories. That's probably not going to help us as a profession to engage with our clients. So we became aware at that time that the issue for us wasn't just around doing a robust communications plan and creating awareness within the public domain, which is exactly why we undertook that analysis. It really needed to, to be about changing the talk track here and making sure that a more familiar term was util utilized in the public interest because our uh, population now, especially with a significant number of immigrants coming into the country, really do not understand what the terminology Upper Canada is. So we're going to move forward, we're going to evolve, our name is going to move forward with us. We hope you'll come with us and use it as often and as frequently as you can and we'd be interested in hearing your feedback as we embark in a very robust communications campaign um, and Sheena Weir is lingering around here in the back of the room. Sheena is responsible for our robust communications plan that will be coming forward. Her and her team are going to do a marvelous job. We'd be interested to hear your thoughts once it gets launched. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to just go over a few issues in real estate because a lot of things are going on. Um, we have a few things coming forward. Just want to give you a heads up so that your real estate practitioners can be made aware. 
We have a three-way DRA or document registration agreement that's going to be coming forward and we're going to be posting that on our website as a new resource for real estate lawyers. The DRA for use by real estate lawyers is there when there are three or more parties in the transaction as opposed to the two or more two parties, which is the current DRA. The resource is an initiative of the Real Estate Liaison Working Group and FOLA, the Law Society, the OBA and Law Pro are participants in that group, so keep an eye out for that for your members. We have a new rule on advertising in real estate, uh, particularly, as many of you know, Rule 4.2-2.1. The purpose of that rule is to address the bait and switch practices that are often a part of advertising, unfortunately, in some of uh, our environments. We want to make sure that there's inclusive pricing, ensuring that all of our consumers and our clients know exactly what they're receiving and what the specified costs are for. So make sure you're following that rule and advising your members about that rule if they're real estate practitioners. Also wanted to just give you a heads up with regard to high risk syndicated mortgage activity. We have issued a notice to lawyers to educate them about some high risk syndicated mortgage investments in the marketplace right now. In these particular schemes, investors are actually being encouraged to invest their savings to fund soft costs in the development of a project. And those costs might include things like um, advertising, drawing up plans or setting up sales offices, things like that. The Law Society is aware of a number of situations where investors have actually suffered significant losses in these high risk transactions where Ontario lawyers have played a role. So the notice includes a list of features that you would sometimes find in these schemes to help lawyers identify them and also some resources on a lawyer's obligation when they're acting in that type of a transaction. Finally, I just want to speak a little bit about changes to TerraView. TerraView is moving to the web. So we understand that the rollout of that new system is going to be commenced in January and the province has been divided into sections for the purpose of that rollout. The rollout is going to occur at different times uh, in different areas of the pro province. The new system is actually going to require lawyers and their staff to use tokens token numbers uh, to sign the documents rather than the keys that we're used to using. The use of the keys is actually going to disappear and TerraView and the government will be releasing more information on that and what lawyers will have to do to get ready. And I just wanted to call to your attention for the real estate practitioners that we at the Law Society will be doing a webcast as well on January 10th if anyone needs some help to get ready for that particular change. Wanted to take a few minutes to encourage all of you uh, to bring forward nominations for our awards. It's award season. We're getting uh, ready for a busy time. The Law Society awards uh, are numerous and I just wanted to remind you what they are today. We have the Law Society Medal which was established in 1985 and it recognizes lawyers who have demonstrated an outstanding service. The Lincoln Alexander Award honors an Ontario lawyer who has shown an enduring commitment to community service on behalf of Ontarians. We have the Laura Legg Award, which is given each year to a female lawyer from Ontario who has exemplified leadership within the profession. For paralegals, we have the William J. Simpson Distinguished Paralegal Award, which recognizes a paralegal who has demonstrated outstanding professional achievement. And of course, we have for lawyers and paralegals, the J. Shirley Dennison Award. And this award recognizes significant contributions to access to justice and poverty issues. And the reason I want to raise this with you today is that I want to strongly encourage all of you and your members to consider making nominations for these awards. I'm sure that you can think of someone in your region or your area who truly deserves this type of recognition. I just wanted to bring to your attention that last year we had over 40 nominations and only six of those nominations came from outside of the Toronto and Ottawa areas. So it's really important for you to get out there and see if there is someone that you'd like to bring forward as a nominee um, so that they can uh, get a much deserved recognition for the work that they do. The deadline for the nominations is at January 26th, so it's coming up pretty soon. So please don't forget if there are people that you'd like to nominate, we'd love to have those nominations. Uh, one last thing before I close, I would uh, be remiss 
if I did not remind you in my former role and in my current role to get your CPD hours by the end of the year. So uh, there are excellent programs scheduled at the Law Society and all of the other providers and also a lot of different webcasts that you can hop onto to get your hours and then make sure that you log those in the member portal. Now that's it for today. I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me. I'm happy to uh, do my best to answer those. agreement if there are three or more parties right uh, so we have a purchaser and a vendor is a mortgagee a third party for the purposes of the new three-party uh, document registration agreement yes okay yeah. so most uh, routine residential purchases and sales would involve the new agreement I, we think so, yes, and we're doing it because the other agreement was well used and people, um, it was very useful for them. And so the group that got together put this uh, in place because we we're getting a lot of requests uh, for having a lack of document. And I think Dan's here too. Um, the document is supported by Law Pro, and I think it's very important for all of us to make sure that we're using the appropriate documentation. Thank so you. It's available shortly, yeah. Okay, quiet crowd. Good, thank you very much. If there are any questions later, I'm happy to take any calls or emails that you may have, and I really appreciate the time today.